Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of The Workspace, a space where we will be talking about business and culture, interviewing people with different backgrounds with a lot of experience to share and for us to learn. My name is Alejandra, and today I will be interviewing Congressman Adam Smith, who is a member of the Congress and represents the 9th District of the State of Washington. He has been the top Democrat at the House Armored Services Committee since 2011 and is here to share his new book. His new book, his memoir, is called Lost and Broken. His new book will reflect about the trajectory about how he overcome depression, chronic pain, and how he turned something so negative into positive. Uh, he will share some tips and some, uh, some of his experience. And we have the interview with him just now. Take a listen to the interview. Welcome to the podcast, Congressman Smith. How are you feeling today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you very much. You recently wrote a book, Lost and Broken. Can you tell us a little bit more about your new book? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I wrote it at first just because I, I'd gone through an extended battle with anxiety and then with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it spread out over an extended period of time, but most intensely from like 2013 to 2020. Um, and I wanted to sort of, well, I wanted to get a sort of a chronicle in my mind of what happened and all that I'd gone through. But then as I was writing it and talking with people, a lot of people in this country suffered from mm -hmm. mental health issues, anxiety, depression. And certainly yeah. there are you know, many that have it very severe. But there's also, gosh, I mean, I would dare to say probably millions of people probably in America at one time or another go through some level of anxiety and depression. Uh, that is mm -hmm. you know, clinical mental illness. And then there's uh, so many other people who go through chronic pain. It's incredibly yes. well documented. And the overarching theme that I got from people was frustration. Frustration that there didn't seem to be a clear path to figuring out how to get a good diagnosis and a good treatment plan to deal with it. Yeah. Number one, and then the second thing that I discovered was help does exist. You know, there, there are methods. Now, it took me, as I document my book, it took me like a hundred different providers of one kind or another to finally find a, um, a psychologist and a muscle activation therapist who knew how to help mm -hmm. me. But once I found them, I mean, it was literally life-changing. So I just really want to tell that story for all those people out there who are going through chronic pain and or mental health issues, the two of which, as you well know, are, are often linked, um, that there is a path um, and to help spark a national discussion about how to mm -hmm. better help people find that path. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I, I've read your book and, and it was, a, you know, I do... I do understand the path of the book. I, I, I haven't, I don't have any chronic um, pain, of course, but, you know, we cannot be 100% happy uh, during our life. There is up and downs. But when you wrote the book, what was the goal with writing your book? Well, the first goal was to sort of an after action report, if you will, um, mm -hmm. in, in, in Congress. I've, I've, was the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee for four years, and I've, I've served on the Armed Services Committee for all 27 mm -hmm. years that I've been in Congress. Um, and that's one of the things the military always does. You know, after, yes. after an engagement, you do an after-action report so that while the, the, the issues are fresh in your mind, you can honestly lay them out and learn from them. And I think that was my thinking, because as, as the book chronicles, I... I had a lot Definitely. of false starts and mistakes throughout the whole thing. <laughs> so I wanted to go back and just sort of, okay, what did I do well? What did I do poorly? What can I learn from this? And then as I was writing it, um, you know, I, it occurred to me that there's a lot of other people that have been through this. So I thought the story held together well enough to put it out publicly. And also I do want to make it easier for people to talk about these subjects. Um, I think, you know, it's part of the problem is there's a stigma certainly yes. against discussing mental illness but i think there's even a there's a stigma against showing weakness if you will true so exactly there is sort of, yeah basically let people know that you know weakness is part of life and if if you look at it correctly 
uh, by being honest about the weaknesses that you face, you can become more resilient and stronger. Not necessarily, mm-hmm. uh, but that's at least you know part of why it's important to be honest about what you're going through in life. Exactly. The, the the one thing that that came to my mind is that by the end of the book uh, and after reading the whole story, uh, which is amazing, uh, in the sense that you you know it's, it's sometimes it's never easy to to ask for help or to to actually know what type of help we can get. Um, and of course, I'm talking about in the point of view in Europe. Um, and which we know a part of how the U.S. healthcare system works, but uh, one of the things is that you actually um, can tell and help readers in the U.S. in how to approach the national healthcare system. Um, but for example, in your case, how you were able to, you know, overcome overcome chronic pain and your crippling anxiety because you suffered a lot with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and I'll come back to the, the, the healthcare systems because mm-hmm. yes, the United States healthcare system makes it much more difficult to get help than it should. Uh, yes. You know, because there are systems so driven by the profit motive um, and by how people are compensated, and healthcare providers are not compensated based on how good a job they do treating you. Uh, mm-hmm. They're compensated based on rules that have already been put in place about what treatments will be paid for. Um, there's all kinds of challenges. And of course, we don't have universal access to health insurance. Yeah. So a lot of people mm-hmm. facing these problems. And frankly, it's something that I went through. A lot of the health care options that I sought out um, didn't take insurance. So even though I had insurance, that wasn't helpful. I had to figure mm-hmm. out some way to pay for it. And as a public servant, I didn't have limitless resources. I certainly had more than some. So yeah, our healthcare system makes that navigation process more difficult. But for me, I think, you know, the basic problem on the mental health side was it's just not something we talk about in America. Now we're getting better at that, yeah. frankly, just in the last three or four years. You know, but I again, I chronicle this in the book that the I, I felt the mental illness was this very bright line, okay? Mm-hmm. Some, some people are crazy and some people aren't. Um, and once you're about 14, 15 years old, it's okay. I'm not crazy. I'm good. Okay. That, you know, and that's just an, obviously not the way it works. So yeah. when I started having these feelings of anxiety, and I do want to make it clear to people that I've been a high stress person my entire life. Um, mm-hmm. I, I worry my way through problems. Um, so I've always sort of had that, but that's different than anxiety. Um, stress and day in and day out worry are obviously things that you need to figure out how to manage. But when you step over that line into an anxiety that literally never goes away, it's basically a constant yeah. feeling of existential fear. I, I use a number of analogies in the book, but it's like, you know, always imagining that, you know, a homicidal maniac is coming at you with a machete and basically feeling that way, no matter what you're doing day in and day out. You know, like you are in Mm -hmm. a fight or flight existential crisis. What triggers that inside of you? Um, You know, and how, you know, and once that comes, what do you do about it? I mean, I had no confidence whatsoever that a psychiatrist or or a psychologist could help me. I mean, my vision of mental health treatment at that point was people going to therapy for sometimes decades and never really getting better. Um, So, you know. So part of it was developing, number one, the idea, yes, mental health, just like, you know, if you fall down and break your leg, you go to a doctor, you get it set, and you, and you recover from it. Uh, yeah. Similarly, if you have anxiety or depression, you need to get a, you know, a more precise diagnosis and then a treatment plan and work with professionals who know how to help you. So that was number one, was just what the hell do yeah. I do here? Um, I'm trying to find someone who could help. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So the the first step is always like I have I need help, but then we have that that question that who am I going to ask for help? Um, there are people that don't know or or think that it is going to be you know very difficult to achieve that that help or to get that help. Um, but it, what tips did you get? Because th- this was uh, a bit of a journey for you. Um, 
you know, what tips can you give to people that, you know, how they, they know about the first step, but how can they apply for help? What, what do you think? Yeah. They could well, do first? and it's, it's, it's different for me between the mental health side and, and the physical health side. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll, I'll bifurcate those two things. I think on the mental health side, the number one biggest tip, tip I would give is um, don't go right to pharmaceutical options. Because I think that's one of the big problems we have in America right now is depression, anxiety, even things that get diagnosed with greater specificity like ADHD, you know, bipolar. Yeah. The American healthcare system, you know, its first answer is always here, take this drug. Um, and I, I would advise people to be more patient about that and get mm -hmm. just some good basic therapy help. And then, and this is going to take a minute or two, but there's a baseline of mental health that I think too many um, psychologists and psychiatrists don't give you. So what, what does it mean to be mentally healthy in the first place? What's, what's likely to be triggering that anxiety? And the baseline first piece of it that was not explained to me after even like 10 different psychologists, and therapists, and psychiatrists is you have to have what psychologists refer to as a healthy narcissism, which is basically you have to believe in your own self-worth. And that sounds yeah. a little, sounds a little weird, new agey. Certainly it did to me, <laughs> you know, yeah. with my very basic blue collar up, upbringing. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. But it's really important. And it, that develops usually in your childhood. Either you yeah. are surrounded in a reasonably safe, loving environment or you're not. And a lot of different things can trigger a feeling that you just don't have fundamental self-worth. And so you have to ask yourself that question. Yeah, this is the line that the psychologist who eventually helped me used on me when I first met with him. He gave me this incredibly long um, questionnaire to fill out, answering questions on a wide variety of subjects. But his conclusion from looking at my questionnaire was, he said to me, you, you don't think you have a right to exist. And again, my initial yeah. reaction to that was, oh, for God's sake, um, you know, <laughs> what the hell is he talking about? You know, but he was right, you know, because of that pressure that I felt, you know, it put pressure yeah. on me in every aspect of my life. Because if you don't think you have a fundamental self-worth, then every second of every day, you're trying to prove it. Okay. Yeah. And whatever it is that you decide you want to do with your life, you have to to succeed, you know, you, you can't make mistakes uh, because it really is an existential crisis. So understanding that basic self-worth is a starting point. And then the second thing that I think we really struggle with in America is be honest with yourself about what you're worried about, about what's gone well, what hasn't gone well. Stuff from back in your childhood can really impact your mental health right now. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to have open, honest discussions about that and also about what's going on in your life right now. So I think having those conversations, psychotherapy, basically, um, you know, and you have to be honest with yourself, acknowledge your self-worth. And then I think there are a lot of methods of what they refer to as cognitive behavioral therapy that, you know, can teach you how to better process your emotions and your feelings so that they are, are less impactful on you so that you can better process them. I mean, that's the basics. And that's what you're doing when you're going to therapy is working through those three basic issues. Fundamental self-worth, honest about stresses in life, past and present. And then how do you process the emotions that you feel? That is such a great tip. <laughs> it's actually so positive. Um, hearing that from you and for everything that you went through uh, and, and you share on your on your book, and and it's the the self worth because sometimes people and and you are right completely when we grew up our childhood is so so special when growing up to develop you know teenagers young adults um, and that's one of the things like to share all that love to have that love unfortunately not many people have it but it's always that part of us the childhood that represents us in in the future um and therapy makes makes all sense and and it's wonderful i do it as well so 
Well, so, yeah. the final, the one final piece on that is, mm -hmm. I think you also have to approach mental health from the standpoint of optimism, from yes. the standpoint of, I want to get better and I want to be resilient. And this is one thing I worry, as, as much as we've gotten better in the last four years about reducing the stigma surrounding mental mm -hmm. health issues and weakness overall, you know, it, it's not an excuse just to wallow in whatever it is that's bothering you. Um, yeah. You also have to have a focus on resiliency. My goal isn't to be able to explain to people why I'm miserable, okay? <laughs> But my goal <laughs> is to figure out how to be happy, healthy, and productive in this life. And I think we need to make, 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 we need to give people that expectation. We yes. need to let people know you can get better, you can be resilient, uh, you can figure this out. Giving that that light of positivity to people that they can do it and they have, um, they obviously have, um, you know, a helping hand uh, somewhere, but they have it. Uh, but being positive is it's yeah, it's the best the best road to to follow. But sometimes you know <laughs> it cannot happen in, in the beginning. But oh yeah. sure, and it's not easy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, but but uh, yeah, life isn't easy. Um, to my mind, that's part of what makes life so so fulfilling um, is, is to meet the challenges that are out there. Uh, but I think yeah. you have you have to be aware of them to be sure. Yes, of course. Um, picking up a little bit, a little bit about how the book was, was produced, and you have been in spotlight, to be honest, for more than twenty six years. Yeah. Um, can you share just a little bit how producing this book was beneficial for you and creating the book? Uh, what was that experience for you, in terms of an author? Well, yeah. Two different aspects of that. One is just mm -hmm. the creative process. And frankly, I, I love the process of writing. When I was in my mm -hmm. mid-20s, I started fooling around with a novel that I wanted to write. And and, and when I first started writing it, I, I you know, and I've got a law degree. Yeah, you know, I got a degree in political science from Fordham University. I got a law degree from the University of Washington. So I'm yeah, you know, what you would, would think of as a reasonably educated person. But I figured out very quickly that writing is difficult <laughs> okay and there was so much about it that i just didn't know now i had a couple friends of mine who had been to writing school and they knew better how to write and so they worked with me on that novel then i, I finished it but it never wound up being published or going anywhere uh, but i learned so much in that process um, about how to write and how to communicate through the written word uh, for the most part in my life what I've been good at is speaking. Um, I, I, I communicate orally quite well, even if that sentence doesn't necessarily back up the claim, but um, I speak well, but writing is a different thing. <laughs> you know, I was just sort of assumed, you know, you put me up in front of any audience and say, talk and just throw the subject at me, I can do it. Okay, so if yeah. I can do that, surely I can write. No, it's, it's, it's a different skill set. So I had to get through that. And then you just, you gotta be patient. Um, it's funny, I was just at a, well, it's not important where I was, but I was speaking with a young woman who's from Nigeria, who's writing, a, she's writing her first novel and she got a fellowship mm -hmm. somewhere to help her work on it. Talking about how, you know, a lot of times when you're writing, you get to the point where you have in your head, okay, this is what I wanna say. And then you type a sentence and you go, eh, that doesn't quite work. And I've literally sat there uh, on that sentence you know, flying back and forth to D.C., sometimes for like a half hour without actually writing anything before finally it comes to me, ah, that's the way I want to talk about it. Yeah. And then also it's important while you're writing, sometimes I, I walk for exercise. So just, you know, just go walk and think about it um, and, and it'll come to you. So that whole process was really interesting. And then, of course, there's the process of given my you know, position as a member of Congress, mm -hmm. you know, contemplating writing a book and putting it out there, you know, it's, it's going to relate back to how I do my job. And I felt that in writing on this subject, on our healthcare system in general, mm -hmm. and mental health in particular, would really help me do my job better. It, it would focus on issues that 
connect to so many of the things that I work on um, and would get me connected to more people who are focused on healthcare and, and mental health. So I think it really does, you know, help me represent the district I represent um, mm -hmm. and work in Congress to have a better understanding of these issues. Of course. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I completely agree. When, when you're a talker, <laughs> Any any type of questions it could come to you, but when writing it's it's difficult. It it gets difficult. You know the idea, yeah. but then to transmit it to the to the to the writing is it it takes more time. Now for not our final question, but and you work in the government. After you wrote your book, were there any of your colleagues? or people that work uh, with you in the government or even the army that approach to you and, you know, they, they, the book represents for them what they feel, for example, are they, how was their reaction to your book? Yeah. Well, first of all, it, it comes out at the end of May here. So uh, a lot of them are not yet aware of it. Uh, but yes, the, the few people who are um, mm -hmm. aware of it, no, I, I had a ton of people from every aspect of my life, um, you know, talk to me about how they've gone through these challenges. And like I said, as, as I've worked through this process, and I, you know, I didn't take out a press release or anything, but I talked to some people yeah. uh, throughout the whole process. And I'm really struck by the fact that chronic pain, mental illness, millions of people in America are impacted by this. And, and a lot of times there were people that I knew reasonably well and I never knew. Never knew they were dealing with yeah. that because it's just not something that you talk about. Um, That's stigma. Right. Yeah, it's stigma. And also you're just sort of going about your life and you may notice, yeah. oh, you know, Bob seems a little off today, you know. What's going on? Yeah. And then that's it. Yeah, you know, next day seems fine. So whatever. So yeah, no, I think it definitely has, you know, got a lot of people to say, hey, yeah, I, I went through a very similar thing. So Yeah, and and it will. And it will. Your book is really great. Not because we are talking, <laughs> but yeah, it's actually resonated with me. Um and my last question is Yes. Can we wait for another book? Are you thinking about another well, book? Well, <laughs> I guess, you know, I am. But, you know, there's a couple of things about that. I mean, first of all, I do, before before I go here, I want to make sure people understand, because I think it can be a little weird. I had a mental health issue. I'm, in my book, I explain it. But, you know, I think a lot of folks are trying to figure out, do I have a problem? Do I not have a problem? In, in, in my personal story, what I try to explain is, for probably, you know, the first 40 years of my life, There were certain indications in terms of my high stress approach, um, yeah. you know, different things that I've done about my life that would have shown that, you know, I could potentially have an issue, but I never had something that was overwhelmingly debilitating. I went about my life and in some way, that feeling of existential threat and that desire to constantly prove myself sort of helped me to be successful in life. Um, But then it just reached the point where I just hadn't processed with that stuff. And the anxiety just spilled over on me first when I was about 40 years old. And then again, um, eight years, eight years later, to the point where I just really couldn't control it. So, I mean, this, this is stuff the point I'm trying to make here is you can have a really significant mental health problem that you should seek help for and still be doing okay in your life. Okay. And I think that's what a lot of people miss. It's like, okay, yeah, I don't feel great, but you know, I'm raising my family. I'm doing my job. I'm, you know, I'm okay. I'm, I'm making it through. Um, yeah, you can do that, but you can still have a challenge and a problem that you need, you need to address. Now, the thing that the, the next book that I'm working on is more, is about, well, it's about representative democracy and civil society. And the great concern that in many places in the world, certainly in the United States, we are struggling to get along as a community. Um, you know, yeah. and this is, you know, from country to country, this is going to be different. But certainly in the U.S., we had the January 6th attack on the Capitol mm -hmm. to try to overturn an election. Civil society is fraying. And yes. I think it is connected to the mental health issue. 
because one of the problems we have with mental health in this country is we don't think enough about other people, which sounds a little counterintuitive. Um, but, you know, I said a healthy, a healthy narcissism. Um, you don't want an unhealthy narcissism. So I want to write about how do you get along as a society? I mean, how does any group of people figure out how to resolve their differences peacefully? Whether you're talking about a family, a homeowners association, or an entire country, okay? I don't mm-hmm. think we've dove deeply enough into the questions of how you balance your own individual wants and needs with the individual wants and needs of others and then with society as a whole. I think we've lost track of the basic necessity of finding that balance. And too often we're just focused on, this is what I want, how do I get it? Definitely. Um, so I'm interested in how I can sort of intersect mental health with the broader health of civil society. Yeah, and definitely, definitely. I would like to read that. So <laughs> I well, will be I, on I, the I, first I, position yeah. <laughs> together. At the, at, the moment, at the moment, I'd like to write that. So I've, I've started, yeah. but I've started, but we'll see if I can pull that together. Well, uh, a couple of more walks and <laughs> then yes. you can start the book. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Congressman, for your time and to share your your ideas, which make all the sense, of course, such as your book. Um, and and yeah, it, it was a pleasure talking to you. Um, and and it was definitely a lot of tips and things that resonating with everyone that I think that they are going to love the book and hearing you. Um, thank you very much. All the great success for the Lost and Broken book and for your career, of course. And probably we will see you again yes, thank you very <laughs> in, much your next, in your next book. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Congressman, and have thank a great day. You as well. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Okay, thank you. And here you go, guys. This was the interview with Congressman Smith. Sorry about the audio. A congressman was on his way to work. Uh, but we can um, hear him perfectly and all his experience and his knowledge in what the Lost and Broken book is all about. For those that are trying to overcome chronic pain, depression, you know, in the life sometimes is not so happy as people think. Um this is a great book to read and to gain some strength and to gain some positive side. So thank you very much, guys, for being with us in this excellent interview and see you again on the next episode. Mm-hmm.